Um, so, in this second uh, uh, part of the lecture, um, I would like to look at some of the arguments about uh, culture industry that uh, Adorno made, and then also speak a bit about uh, that other notion of culture, you know, like culture proper to which culture industry sometimes seems to be opposed in Adorno. Um, and then finally uh, conclude with two things. Uh, one is uh, that uh, differences between the uh, approaches to culture, especially uh, contemporary technologically uh, informed cultural practices which between Adorno and Benjamin, and uh, then talk a little bit in conclusion about Adorno's own style of writing and his style of philosophizing and the kind of relationship it has with some of the things which he valorizes in modernism, literary modernism and uh, artistic uh, modernist practices. Yeah? So uh, in, in uh, Adorno there is, uh, there, there is an attempt to develop a, a theory of culture in some sense. You, know, you could say that uh, he uses some of Marx's concepts uh, about uh, production, distribution, exchange, consumption. Uh, Gillian Rose's book actually tracks uh, some of these uh, relationships in detail. Many of the arguments which I presented here, uh, uh, I'm indebted to Gillian Rose's analysis of Adorno's uh, uh, text, so I would recommend Rose's book to you. Uh, in fact, it appears as one of the readings, you know, further readings in the, uh, in the sheet which was circulated. Now, what Gillian Rose suggests is that Adorno uses these concepts in a way which is different from Marx's use of them in relationship to political economy. Like uh, uh, questions of production, for example, in the context of culture, uh, According to Rose, Adorno explores them most clearly when he discusses composition in the case of music. Yeah. Now, Adorno himself was a composer, and uh, uh, ideas, a discussion of composition as akin to or analogous to the idea of production becomes important for him. Now, similarly, distribution, questions of distribution are uh, discussed in the field of culture in the context of reproduction. Exchange, primarily in the context of what I don't know called the culture industry. And consumption uh, in relation to practices of reception. So uh, when we read Adorno's writings on culture, we will find all these four elements coming up. That is questions of composition, reproduction, uh, issues of the culture industry, and finally questions of reception. Yeah. Now, I already indicated in the brief abstract which is circulated uh, that uh, the, when Adorno and Horkheimer first wrote this uh, chapter on the culture industry for dialectic of the enlightenment, the, the term which they thought of to characterize what they wanted to speak about was mass culture. Yeah. Now, they, they decided against it. Uh, Adorno clarifies this in that culture industry reconsidered a say, because Mass culture may give the impression that we are here speaking about a domain of culture that spontaneously arises from the masses. Uh, the argument that culture industry makes is precisely that it is not the spontaneous culture of the masses. Rather, it is <clears throat> a culture, a frame of culture, a frame of cultural practices which is uh, managed from above and which kind of incorporates the masses as if they were appendices to a machinery. Now, now this idea is important, that uh, uh, it is not mass culture in the sense in which the masses become the agent of culture or the subject of cultural practices. Rather, it is mass culture in the sense of a culture which is dis dispensed to the masses which interpolates them as subjects into that. So it is here that uh, the point I made earlier about questions of schematism, etc., become important. You remember that argument about Kant and uh, the, the, 
way in which experience itself becomes possible because of a certain schema which we have. Here, the schema itself is what culture industry seems to provide for the encounter with cultural artifacts. Yeah. Now, some of Adorno's questions have a contemporary salience because we know that uh, 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 cultural studies over the last uh, three, four decades have actually tried to take popular culture and cultures of consumption seriously. And um, uh, in so far as um, culture studies has been able to make a kind of uh, uh, intellectual intervention in the study of popular culture, it is in seeing popular culture as a positivity rather than as a negativity, you know, in the sense that popular culture seems to, the, the culture studies has tried to specify that popular culture seems to have its own kind of particular domain with its own regulations, conditions of production, etc., etc., which cannot be explained away in terms of a logic which is outside the domain of popular culture, be it that of elite culture or be it that of manipulation. Now, in that sense, you could say that quite a bit of cultural studies uh, is in some kind of tension with Adorno's critique of the culture industry. Now, we shall, of course, uh, you know, if there is time, we shall, of course, revisit this issue. At the same time, cultural studies involves a critique of popular culture as well, not in the name of elite culture, but in terms of the kinds of subjectivities it generates the kind of cultural practices it puts forward, et cetera, et cetera. So there, it also has a point of convergence or at least conversation with some of the points that Adorno is making. So in that sense, you could say that culture in, uh, Adorno's arguments about culture industry, are bo they both anticipate what later on comes up as cultural studies, but they also are in some sense of tension with some of the more uh, uh, radical claims which culture studies has been make, ab able to make in the study of popular culture. Now, you know that uh, when uh, uh, British cultural studies uh, began, uh, the Birmingham School and the early writings of cultural studies, one of the uh, issues which uh, led to the kind of studies which they undertook was to inquire into the disappearance of solidarities among the British working class. And so where, how did these solidarities uh, disintegrate and disappear? And then in order to have an account of that, you needed to look at the cultural practices. So again, the account of the positivity of cultural practices <coughs> arose there in response to a question which was diagnostic in relationship to a negative phenomenon. That is the erosion of solidarities and the absence of something. Yeah? So it is good to keep this in mind you know, uh, when we think about uh, the question of the culture industry. Now, uh, the culture industry is, um, uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's really analogous to the domain of exchange. So the, at the heart of the argument that Adorno and Horkheimer made is the argument that uh, it is determined by the principle of the realization of cultural products as value. That is, uh, their commodities, uh, their, the, uh, their realization is in the realization of value. Yeah? So this is opposed to, in Adorno's analysis, both in, the, uh, in dialectic of enlightenment and especially, more pronouncedly in the later essay, you will see that uh, this is contrasted with something else, that is, the cultural products are actually, uh, uh, the, the culture industry is not determined by the specific content or the harmonious formation of cultural products. Yeah. So th this is the alternative or different idea of culture with which culture industry is contrasted. That is, culture as a domain which is determined by the status of cultural products in terms of their specific content or in terms of their harmonious formation. Yeah? So it, th behind this, of course, there are certain aesthetic assumptions which become more clear 
when we actually look at Adorno's own writings on literature and his uh, uh, writings on music and things of that kind. Now, it's, it's easy to dismiss this as a kind of traditional aesthetic obsession. That is, you are actually designating as culture, culture industry something which does not work with the old style aesthetic assumptions uh, of harmony and uh, content and things of that kind. Uh, to correct that, we actually need to look at Adorno's own writings <coughs> on literature, music, and things of that kind, where there is a very strong argument against assessing works of art or explaining works of art in terms of their content. Their historicality is not to be found in terms of content. This is the point where he engages in serious uh, disagreements with Lukács on the one hand and uh, Brecht on the other, and interestingly Brecht on the other. So, so that we will come to later on after we uh, get, go through some of the arguments about the culture industry. So culture industry is not a positive culture of the masses. It integrates <coughs> consumers from above. So the subjects of culture are essentially consumers of culture. Yeah? And so the, mass, the masses who are the uh, interpolated subjects of culture, they become an object of calculation. So the question of calculation, we need to understand it in relation to that entire discussion we had in the first lecture about uh, enlightenment, reason, and its close relationship to uh, the figure of calculation, ratio, reason as uh, calculation. So uh, instead of being shaped by the specific content or harmonious formation of cultural products, uh, the profit motive becomes uh, important. The profit motive is uh, important here. And the profit motive, of course, it is, it's not that uh, profit motive is alien to the domain of culture until the modern period. But in Adorno's argument, profit motive comes to become the organizing principle of culture industry in a way in which it did not in the earlier configurations. Yeah. It's not like a profit motive is something completely new, like it's a fall from innocence of some kind, but it comes to have a formative role or shaping role in terms of which everything else needs to be understood. It is in that sense that exchange, the realization of value, etc., become important. More than that, the profit motive is actually uh, uh, not ashamed of itself. In fact, it, it kind of establishes itself in terms of an ideology. Yeah. This ideology in Adorno is uh, that of uh, uh, an ideology of culture as a domain of influencing people, manipulating people, etc., etc. Now, this comes up in our modern idea of public relations, for example. Now, uh, Habermas, for example, in the Structural Transformation has a discussion of this, you know, that uh, in our times, politics itself is managed by public relations. You know, he's speaking about uh, uh, Germany in the 1960s, of course, you know, but uh, public relations really becomes uh, that space where opinions can actually be influenced and manipulated. Now, culture has become the paradigm or the template for thinking about public relations. So culture in some sense, this culture industry in some sense, is also a kind of a, a, a domain where a certain sense of well-being can be manufactured, a certain idea of a, a, a belonging to the particular political space can be manufactured, etc., etc. So uh, the idea of profit motive, you could say, becomes the model for thinking about the instrumental reason in terms of which the idea of culture needs to be conceived. That is, culture is a particular kind of practice which can actually obtain definite results according to a certain procedure of calculation. That is where the ideology instantiates itself in public relations, things of that kind. Yeah? So uh, for Adorno, these kinds of ideas of uh, the culture industry are deeply uh, uh, status quoist. That is, the domain of culture in culture industry becomes a space 
which would actually make you happy with the way things are. Uh, so its primary aim is actually to make order into a source of happiness. That is the way things are at the moment into a source of well-being. In other words, you could say that culture is about an incentive which is provided for inhabiting an order which is already given. Now, for Adorno, this idea of culture is in con or culture industry is in contrast with uh, uh, what he otherwise names the proper idea of culture. There, his argument, what he invokes is that culture in general has signified some moment of uh, conflict or distance from the order in all locations. That is why we see it as a distinctive domain. Like, if we see what is in literature and what, what we see in art as merely a reflection of what exists in the world, then culture will not be able to perform any kind of function which we attribute to it earlier. Its function was actually to have some kind of a, a, a rupture or distance or dislocation in relationship to things as they are. Sometimes it may take the form of criticism, sometimes it may take the form of uh, utopias, and sometimes it may take the form of a lament you know, about uh, lost relationships, etc., etc. But culture in all these accounts seems to offer a space for subjectivities which are not properly inhabitable in the, or locatable in the existing order of things. So there is a kind of experience of uh, uneasy inhabitation or disinhabitation, which is actually at the core of the earlier ideas of culture. Now, culture industry in Adorno's account is precisely that practice where this is eliminated. Instead, culture becomes a tool for facilitating inhabitation, facilitating properly locating subjectivities in the given order. So it, it is in this way that it actually fulfills its deeply conservative or status quoist function. Now, there are a couple of other, other points, you know, since you have read the essay, I'm not going to summarize the essay, but there are a couple of other points which uh, uh, are important for us to notice. One is uh, 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 about the use of a paradigm of industrial work. Now, again, the reconsider reconsidering culture industry that essay actually speaks about it. That is, uh, industrial forms of work become a model for thinking about all kinds of work. Now, this is probably true, uh, even more pronounced in our times, where uh, corporate forms of organizing certain things become a template. In fact, even the language in which culture criticism is written in our time often seems to borrow the vocabulary of uh, uh, corporate arrangements and uh, 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 corporate logistics in some sense. Yeah? So what I don't know is speaking about is the industrial organization becoming a template which travels and which becomes the model for organizing practices even in areas which have uh, no reason for having the industry and organization as a model. Like industrial organization is a model for organizing production. So even where there is no production involved, you may get the replication of uh, relationships which come from industrial organization for organizing activities. So Adorno's example for that is uh, office work. Office work increasingly, you know, he's writing in the 1940s, gets rationalized in ways which replicate the model of industrial organization. Yeah. Uh, now, so there is an increased deployment of uh, technical uh, inputs and technical organization, uh, what we have come to see as uh, the managerial moves, you know, the managerial logistics in organizing the world of cultural practices. Now there, this technique is, you know, of course, technique is a word which is uh, deeply associated with the world of art right from its uh, beginnings, you know, like uh, the very idea of techni and uh, art. But technique is understood in quite a different way from 
its earlier uses in relationship to culture. That is earlier, you have the idea of technique in relationship to artworks as a matter of the internal organization of the work of art. You speak about the, the technique, which is a tissue uh, in a poem or in a sculpture or in a musical composition, where technique is actually not distinguished from meaning, but technique is actually the principle in terms of which the specific meaning of the work of art is realized in its form. Yeah? So this uh, idea of technique uh, is uh, not what is at issue in the use of the idea of technique in culture industry. Rather, technique becomes a matter of uh, distribution and of uh, mechanical reproduction. Now, we know that uh, uh, this argument, of course, when we read it now, we read it uh, in relationship to the argument about technological reproduction which uh, Walter Benjamin developed um, in the 1930s. You know. Now, Adorno is, of course, uh, uh, he already in 1936, in his uh, correspondence with Adorno, uh, Benjamin, he actually uh, has some arguments and uh, discussions about the uh, technological reproduction argument. But here, he is making a point which is of a larger kind, that technique does not pertain to the individual work, the internal organization, etc. Rather, it pertains to reproduction and distribution. It is something which is external to the work. Now, towards the end of this talk, we'll have an opportunity to talk about uh, some of Benjamin's arguments and Adorno's responses to that. So at that time, we can revisit this question of technology. Now, uh, I, I already mentioned that uh, Adorno's account of culture industry, his criticism of culture industry, mainly sees culture industry as promoting status quo. That is, order itself as it exists becomes the goal of culture industry. That is, something which exists becomes the uh, goal. In that sense, it is reproduced as a goal by culture industry. Now, in this, he sees uh, uh, culture industry as uh, 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 replacing consciousness with conformity. Now, this again is a, an important formulation in Adorno that there is some uh, critical value which is placed on the idea of consciousness here. But at the same time, consciousness here needs to be seen not in psychologistic terms, but as some aspect of the individual in relationship to larger structural wholes. Now, this problem of the individual is a, a difficult problem in Adorno. You know, that again, and if there is time, we can talk about it. On the one hand, Adorno is uh, deeply critical of the idea of the bourgeois individual. You know? Now, the bourgeois individual itself is actually, the individual subject of bourgeois arrangements itself is actually, uh, you could say, an illusion. The bourgeois individual is not a goal in terms of which uh, Adorno's analysis work. But at the same time, in the discussions of culture industry, individual becomes a kind of anchoring point for some mode of uh, criti uh, critical agency, uh, some form of resistance to the overall domination of the arrangements that culture industry proposes. So you have uh, some kind of a positive value or critical value which is assigned to the individual in opposition to massification. Because culture industry produces the mass as its model. You know, it works with the mass as the subject of uh, culture. Now in Benjamin, you have quite a different reading of the mass as the subject of cultural practices. Here, interestingly, the individual comes up time and again as a point of resistance against this kind of massification. So, but you know, this, this seeming contradiction in Adorno is uh, uh, not seeming, it's actually a contradiction in Adorno, is perfectly in tune with his philosophical method, as I told you. Like on the one hand, you have the reified categories of uh, thought available to you in, a, in your time, but it is in re making them work and making them reveal the problematic nature of their connection with the object they are referring to that Adorno's critique seems to work and seems to take it forward. So the individual is, on the one hand, it, it draws on 
the reified category of the bourgeois individual. On the other hand, it also tends to make it work in a way which problematizes the relationship which comes with the bourgeois ideology itself. Now, this, this uh, 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 two-pronged uh, nature of the analysis, two-pronged where uh, the two different dimensions are in some kind of uh, tension with each other, you know, uh, is uh, central to Adorno's method. On the one hand, you have a, uh, an attempt to describe. It's not as if the theoretical task is given up. There is a repeated attempt to describe, provide an explanation of culture industry, bourgeois society, the current domain of cultural practices. On the other, other hand, there is also this attempt to uh, unhinge the, the concepts which we are using in that process and trying to show uh, that these concepts themselves are actually complicit in some kind of reification of thought. You know? So it is that dual movement or that, that dif the two different uh, uh, f uh, lines of analysis which are intimate and in tension with each other that we need to recognize. So the individual is uh, an important site of that, I would say. Yeah? So, so uh, I don't know even go so far as to say that culture industry actually impedes the development of autonomous individuals who can judge and decide for themselves. You know? But this idea of the autonomous individual itself is actually a problem in Adorno. It's not something which you can accept the way in which uh, uh, the liberal aesthetics about the arts speaks about it. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> the, the uh, conclusion of uh, the analysis offered in Dialectic of Enlightenment as well as in the reconsidered essay is that culture industry is anti-enlightenment. But when, when we say anti-enlightenment, we should understand that this anti-enlightenment is an inseparable dimension of the enlightenment. That, that is the thing. That is, culture industry is anti-enlightenment in the sense that enlightenment, enlightenment as progressive technical domination of nature here becomes mass deception and it is turned into a means of fettering consciousness. That is, Enlightenment, as we saw, uh, is liberating. It, it is actually uh, uh, seen as freedom and liberating man from fear. But here it becomes mass deception where consciousness is actually fettered. Now, in that sense, it is anti-enlightenment. But what is called anti-enlightenment here is an outcome not of some kind of external perversion to which enlightenment is subject, but out of that deep complicity between reason and domination which characterizes the enlightenment itself. So we saw that enlightenment uh, in its kind of uh, uh, fear of the myth, uh, fear of uh, what is other to reason, uh, it actually eliminates the space of myth and space of all these uh, things which are other than reason, you know, like spirit, uh, uh, animism, all these kinds of things. And positivism is the final frontier of that in some sense, where that is uh, seemingly fully eliminated. Now, similarly, in the case of uh, 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 culture industry, what you find is a reaction to the fear of all that cannot be manipulated takes the form of mass deception. So instead of uh, reason and liberation of mankind uh, from fear, fear expresses itself in the form of a mass deception which makes you feel fearless. So, so this is the argument which is uh, being proposed about. Is it clear? Is it, yeah. Okay, so, so we have got a reasonable account of uh, the main arguments in the, in the culture industry things. They're, they're, you know, I, I summarize them somewhat schematically, especially in the dialectic of enlightenment, uh, when you read the piece and when you read the piece again, you will see that the complex movement of thought is uh, much more in excess of the schematic summary I have offered here. Now, this account you know, will not be complete if we do not actually look at what Adorno, uh, uh, Adorno's criticism of culture industry 
takes up as a kind of a, a, a normative uh, a moment to compare it with. That is, culture industry is compared with some other notion of culture. But this some other notion of culture, like the idea of the individual, needs to be seen as a problematic category which is caught up between description on the one hand and a critical self-interrogation or demolition on the other. So what is that idea of uh, culture? This comes up in Adorno's writings on music, literature, uh, etc. And uh, uh, Gillian Rose uh, correctly points out that uh, in music was of special uh, importance to Adorno for thinking about questions of production or composition. Uh, because in music, you cannot really speak about a representational content. And now, this is very central to Adorno's arguments about literature. And uh, you could say that in that sense, music offers him uh, a very important, a very useful template for thinking about cultural forms. That is, you do not have a representational content to speak about. You know? uh, like, this can be contrasted with uh, uh, the kind of literary criticism that was dominant in the Marxist tradition, where you have an account of content as a category, a content which you separate from form. In fact, uh, if I remember right, Lukács even has uh, arguments like content is actually revolutionary, form is conservative, etc., etc. Yeah, and the content, the what is recognized as content, often is also translatable, like. You can put that into some kind of a <clears throat> trans relationship of translation with things like worldview. So you say that this novel has a particular content, it tells a particular story, and we are familiar with it. This, this has still continued to be the, uh, even, even if it is disguised by a lot of formal sophistry, this has continued to be the main form in which we make a political and moral criticism of literary works. So we, we isolate some kind of content, and we say that uh, uh, a certain kind of uh, character or certain, certain type is presented in a bad way, or some, some uh, type is excluded, etc., etc. From this, we translate that absence into a worldview, and that worldview is criticized in its own right. The criticism of the worldview, you could say, does not really need art to make that critic. Like the critique of bourgeois ideology does not need the novels of Balzac to make the point. You know. So in, in uh, Lukács, that, that is an important issue. Now, music makes this difficult, you know, that's, which is why music was particularly uh, important for Adorno. Now, this doesn't mean that music has no relationship to society or history. But the, the relationship that a musical work possesses with society needs to be found in the way in which the form itself is shaped. Now, the word form is actually in a way inadequate here because the form is indis indistinguishable from content here. There is some kind of inscription of the relationship between society and art at the time when the work of art is actually made in the work of art itself. And that relationship is not one of worldview or content. It's a relationship between society and art, that relationship itself is actually manifesting itself in the specificity of form, etc., etc. Now this form, again, we shouldn't isolate it from uh, the larger gamut of practice. After all, what is form except an input into reception? You know, because a particular form of composition is a particular uh, uh, demands, uh, makes a particular set of demands on reception, let's say. So without an account of those practices of reception, you cannot also understand the form. You know, because the form is not uh, something which exists in a kind of decontextualized gallery of forms. You know? So when we say that uh, in a work of art, the relationship between society and art is inscribed at the level of form, we are speaking about this, uh, uh, the kind of uh, aesthetic practice where it is inscribed. And this is different from the idea of content and the idea of uh, uh, a translatable or paraphrasable content which can be understood in terms of worldview. 
So, so this is one uh, important point to remember when we talk about uh, uh, the uh, question of uh, uh, Adorno's approach to uh, works of art. Now, the social meaning of a work of art, which is actually this relationship between society and art, may not also be identical to what you call the social function of that work of art. The social function of that work of art may actually change over a period of time. Like a work of art which may have a um, radical function at a particular point in time may have very different functions at a different point in time. You know? So uh, there are uh, differences or distinctions to be made between uh, the question of social meaning and the question of social function, which once again complicates and sets new tasks for cultural criticism. Yeah? Now, so Adorno's argument, you could say, is that uh, in, in some sense, uh, uh, it, it tries to address both these dimensions. One is what we call composition or production, and the other is reception, uh, where questions of circulation, distribution, etc., become important. Now, some of uh, Adorno's arguments uh, with uh, Benjamin have their origin in this kind of uh, way of looking at things. Let us uh, very briefly take this question of technological reproducibility because uh, Adorno has a bit of a discussion of that, not, not really as an implicit response to Benjamin in the uh, culture industry essays. There, he's primarily, he's arguing against a certain set of arguments which have come up justifying the procedures of culture industry on grounds of uh, efficiency and uh, in the later essay, even on grounds of democracy. Yeah. That is, uh, the efficiency argument is that uh, uh, in modern times, a large number of people have similar needs. So the efficient way of addressing them is to use technologies which actually make them available in large numbers to this uh, uh, big audience, you know, the massified audience. Yeah? So in other words, here, a, a principle of efficiency justifies the large scale of production which technology assumes here. Yeah. Uh, it is not seen as altering the, uh, the relationship which is involved. And uh, the second argument is about democracy. You know, this, of course, is an important argument in relation to our own times and in relationship to cultural studies because we know that one of the uh, political claims which underlies cultural studies is about a certain uh, principle of democracy because uh, popular culture, etc. Uh, if you have an account of culture which does not take into account the positivities of popular culture, then it is actually uh, 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 not responding to uh, the democratic claim which is made on culture in our times. Yeah? So what is presented as massification on one side, on the other side is democratization. Yeah. Think about in India the study of popular cinema, you know, which has come up. You know, the, the most important studies of popular cinema, uh, which have come up in India, have made the argument of its uh, politics in relationship to democracy. Uh, that is, you see there a political imaginary which has democracy as its context. In other words, you could say that some of the best work on Indian cinema, Indian popular cinema, are actually studies into Indian democracy, rather than uh, merely uh, uh, the history of cinema alone. Yeah? So uh, in I don't know, there is uh, a reluctance to accept these arguments. This is important. Now, of course, I don't know is writing in a context which is different. But uh, the argument he makes is that uh, 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 Adorno does not see uh, any kind of positive construction of uh, mass subjectivities or critical uh, con construction of critical mass subjectivities emerging from this technological reproducibility, which makes the same thing available to a large number of people. For Adorno, this is actually a kind of control. That is, a new form of control is created 
through technological reproduction. It controls what people choose, what they see as a desirable taste. Even the illusion of choice is actually created through technological reproduction. This is, so there is nothing redemptive uh, in technological reproduction as such. Yeah. Now, uh, we know that uh, Benjamin had a very different kind of uh, 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 response to the question of technological reproduction. Now, we, you know, Amlan has uh, discussed Benjamin with you, and um, you know, some of these ideas may have come up in the in the discussion. Like Benjamin's argument about technological reproducibility is made within the context of. A, a set of arguments about what he calls the decay of aura. Yeah? Now, aura itself is understood initially in relationship to uh, the kind of subjectivity created in cult, religious practices and cult. Then you have a kind of, uh, that, that auratic formation travels into spaces which are actually not religious formations like in museums, for example. And our, what we call the aesthetics of contemplation in, in Benjamin is uh, something which uh, is associated with these auratic configurations. Now, Benjamin's uh, main uh, formulation there is that uh, aura is actually a tissue of space and time. It's about an experience of distance which you cannot get closer. However close you may get, there is an unsurpassable dimension of distance which separates you from this uh, quasi-sacred object of the work of art. Yeah? Now, <coughs> uh, this, this of course enables a certain mode of apprehension. That mode of apprehension is what Benjamin calls contemplation, yeah? uh, which allows focused contemplation in front of the desired object. Yeah? <clears throat> what technological reproduction changes or what it upsets is precisely this configuration. That is why it is interesting for Benjamin you know, that the decay of aura uh, is uh, 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 intensified in the moment of technological reproduction because Technological reproduction is not merely mass multiplication. It is actually a violation of this crucial modality of distance, yeah, that it brings things closer to you. Benjamin's argument is that the masses want to bring things closer to you, uh, closer to them. They do not want to go to Louvre to look at Mona Lisa. They want Mona Lisa in their bedrooms. Yeah. So you have actually the multiple prints make that possible. So music, again, comes to you in the form of uh, gramophone records and other kinds of things. So Benjamin's interest is actually in the, the change which technological reproducibility enables in the relationship with the object in question. Yeah. Now, their auratic relationships are seen as breaking apart. And something else comes up in its place. That something else which comes up in, it play, in its place, Benjamin kind of uh, had different formulations, I think, in the work of art essay to indicate what that is. Now, now uh, you get you know, two ideas which have been developed subsequently by other people as well. One is uh, a certain idea of uh, a haptic engagement. That is, instead of looking at an object from a distance, you have an activity of taking hold of the object. Yeah? Uh, you remember the very well-known uh, discussion of that metaphor of uh, the magician and the surgeon that, that uh, uh, he uses to contrast the work of uh, the painter and the uh, cinematographer. So uh, the painter is like the magician in the sense that with maintaining that auratic distance from the object, with uh, a laying of hands, the magician works his authority. The cameraman, on the other hand, is like a surgeon 
who opens your body up and penetrates into uh, your body to fix things, rearrange things. In fact, it's a beautiful passage and my memory is bad, so I don't remember it well. So uh, there, is, there are all kinds of interesting fine tunings in, in that formulation that uh, the distance, the oratic distance of the magician is momentarily annulled by a moment of touch. And uh, the penetration of the body performed by the surgeon is uh, 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 attenuated, you could say, or contrasted with the great care with which the hands move inside your body. Yeah? So what, what is at issue here is a distinction between a model of apprehension which is dominated by contemplation, which relies on distance, an unsurpassable tissue of distance, and on the other hand, a haptic engagement which annuls that distance and makes a different engagement possible. Yeah? Now, uh, another idea which comes up as the alternative uh, or, the, or to characterize the transformation which, which happens in these structures of relationships with the work of art in conditions of technological reproducibility is that of distraction. Now, against contemplation, you have the idea of distraction. Now, this is an idea more difficult to uh, capture because distraction, especially to teach, because distraction is a bad word in the classroom. So uh, concentration is what, uh, what is recommended. Yeah. But to understand the idea of distraction, um, there are two things which would help us. One is Benjamin's own invocation of architecture as a model for thinking about it. That is, when you are using a building, uh, you know, when you are looking at a building, using it, you are actually uh, uh, apprehending it in a complex set of modes where contemplation plays a certain delimited role. Your recognition of features of the building, your recognition of uh, particular architectural uh, uh, characteristics of the building may not really be done through uh, a moment of totalizing visual apprehension. You may, when you're tired, you may sit down on the floor or you, know, you may climb the steps, all kinds of things. Now here, there is a kind of bodily engagement with the object, which uh, uh, Benjamin associated quite a lot with the idea of habit. What allows you to take in the object is a certain bodily capacity for habit. It is in relationship to that that the object is actually uh, uh, responded to and taken in. Uh, the second example of distraction one may find in uh, uh, Benjamin's uh, discussion of Brecht. You know, this is also the time when he was very close to Bertolt Brecht and he wrote these um, uh, pieces on the epic theater and uh, stuff like that. So there, you know, in Brecht also, you remember that, see, when Brecht, when he speaks about the alienation effect, you know, uh, he also has the idea of uh, creating a spectator who is actually not uh, subjected to the oratic, uh, oratic control of the object that he is witnessing. Okay. But uh, often we tend to, you know, at, or not often, but sometimes we tend to think that instead of the oratic spectator, what Brecht has is a critical spectator who is equally focused and concentrated on what is being shown on the stage. In other words, like an interrogator, you know, somebody who submits the theatrical spectacle to some kind of interrogation. But that is not the model, like uh, Brecht's many interviews. and you know, His examples are more like uh, people watching a football match. You know? And uh, uh, so, when you're watching a football match, you are actually doing a lot of things. You are talking about other things, you are eating, you know, and uh, you may be asking people who are standing in front of you to sit down, and you are also making comments on what is happening on the, uh, uh, in the football uh, field, you know, in the playground. Uh, we know from our experience of cricket in the country that uh, all spectators of cricket has uh, expert advice on 
uh, field placement, on bowling changes. You know, everybody has advice for the captain, the batsman. You know, so everybody is an expert. You know, this is the important thing to understand. You know? And this expertise is exercised in a state of distraction. You could say that this expertise is produced in a state of distraction. Uh, so, the, so the, here there are some kind of relationships with democracy, you know, which we could uh, uh, talk about. The idea of the expert here is actually quite of a different kind. And it is certainly not an expert in terms of uh, a knowledge which is attained through training in some kind of uh, proper way, so to say. Rather, it is an expertise which is accumulated in a way which is closer to habit, uh, things which are accumulated in a state of distraction, etc., etc. Yeah? So to understand Benjamin's uh, uh, ideas about what technological reproducibility was making possible in relationship to the decay of aura needs to be understood in terms of this contemplation in opposition to distraction on the one hand and uh, some kind of idea of a haptic which is again placed in some distinction with uh, distance. Yeah. Now these things come up in Benjamin's writings on the epic theatre. Like uh, he says that the proscenium stage is replaced by a political platform. Now, we, we, uh, you know, at one level it looks like what is at issue there is um, that political instruction uh, or political arguments can be made from the stage which violates the fictional illusion of the story being performed on the stage. But something becomes a political platform only if the relationships are actually changed. If we think about the stage as becoming a political platform, we should think of the, the playhouse itself as a political meeting. In a political meeting, what happens is a debate. What happens is uh, the conflicts of points of view, etc., etc. So Harvard Kegel, in one of his uh, early writings, he spoke about uh, the effect of the epic theater as meant, in Benjamin's argument, as meant to indicate a differentiation of the audience. The audience which is kept as a unity by the oratic impact of the theatrical spectacle here becomes differentiated into a political entity. It becomes differentiated precisely because of the different political points of view that the use of the stage as a political platform can give rise to. So there you can see both these ideas coming together. No, in the sense, the, the, the model of political debate there is not that of experts in politics debating it, but rather people who have a claim to politics by virtue of their conscious and unconscious participation in political life. So in that sense, there is a relationship to the idea of distraction. And at the same time, there is also a clear relationship to the idea of taking hold or the idea of the haptic. Now, these are some of the, you know, this is merely an indication of some of uh, Benjamin's ideas which come up in relationship to technological reproducibility. Now, Adorno uh, argues in relationship to some of Benjamin's claims that um, uh, he argues that oratic works are not always uh, uh, non radical. Like you can have oratic works, works which work by aura also performing uh, new kinds of functions or uh, critical functions. It is not that all critical art needs to be uh, in a kind of Brechtian mode. This is one point which he makes. In other words, the radical possibilities of art are not limited to uh, technological reproduction and the new relationships which they seem to have uh, augured. Now, uh, the second point which he makes is that even, uh, forget about aura, but even within the larger framework of autonomous art, there are works of art which actually uh, make very strong claims of the autonomy of art, but which can still perform 
uh, a radical function in relationship to aesthetic practices and which can be completely against the dominant norms. And his own comments on Schoenberg's music, for example, is an, is an instance of this. And it is also the case that some of his readings of the modernist writers, like uh, Kafka, for instance, you know, and uh, Beckett, both these are uh, moving in this kind of direction. That is, it is not merely the non erratic work which has the prerogative of being radical in changing perceptual relationships. You can actually have works which still work within the framework of the aesthetic, so to say, autonomy of art, which can still challenge this. And this is uh, the point he makes. Now, Gillian Rose makes this important point that Adorno's uh, account of technological reproducibility, we may not be able to fully understand it if we do not see that he is uh, rigorously maintaining a distinction which comes from Marx's own analysis of political economy between the forces of production and the relations of production. Now, this is something which I'm sure is familiar to all of you. you know, like, uh, uh, it, is, it is actually the disparity between the growth of forces of production with the relations of production which often lead to changes in social formations you know, or modes of production in Marx. Yeah. Now, uh, as a force of production, technological reproduction may be considered in terms of technologies which produce the radio, the gramophone, etc., etc. Now, soon after Adorno moved to uh, New York, he was working on a project on the radio. And, uh, but uh, as a matter of on the side of relations of production, he would argue that technological reproducibility creates a new mode of distribution which presupposes dominant modes of production and exchange in society. So separating these two things or making a distinction between these two things, on the one hand, you can say that technological reproducibility enables the appearance of certain new modes of address, certain new modes of uh, 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 existence of works of art. But on the other hand, we also need to see it as a mode of distribution which can work within existing frameworks of exchange and or dominant frameworks of exchange in terms of the market. You know? Now, it is here that there is actually a little bit of a missed uh, encounter in the reading of Benjamin here because Benjamin is also suggesting, Benjamin does not really make his analysis in terms of this separation, but he's suggesting that there are new perceptual relationships which are created. And these new perceptual relationships also need to be seen as uh, relations of production. They are not merely a matter which stays outside the economy, which stays outside these two categories which we are speaking about, but the changes in perceptual relations themselves may actually be taken into account. And that's not something which uh, uh, Adorno really explores. The reason for this is, again, something, one possible reason for this is that unlike Benjamin, who thinks about uh, the question of uh, technology in terms of a history of the human sensorium, uh, in Adorno, the basic grid is uh, focused on the question of consciousness and the question of reason. It is reason self-entrapment which he is interested in uh, uh, criticizing and exploring. The question of the sensorium remains uh, not sufficiently encountered in, in uh, Adorno's writing. Uh, you know, I'm, when I, as I'm saying it, I feel that that may not be true, but it's not very clear to me how that uh, how the idea of the sensorium really uh, uh, comes up in I don't know you know how there is a specific encounter with that question you know that 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 remains uh, that limits the kind of responses that I don't know gives to Benjamin on many occasions yeah. now uh, about very quickly you know we need to also speak about I don't know's own kind of literary criticism uh, and here especially the debates which happened in the 19 uh, uh, 20s and the 30s about uh, uh, 
realism and modernism. Now, I, I suggested, you know, I al already mentioned that, I'll take another five minutes or so. And, uh, so, I already suggested that uh, in Lukács, uh, there was this, you know, Lukács, as you know, was uh, very unhappy with uh, what he called the realism of our times, that's contemporary realism. And uh, uh, he, he felt that uh, people like uh, Kafka, you know, uh, get trapped in the depiction of the world in which they live rather than produce a totality. Now we know that uh, Lukács' basic grid about thinking about uh, fiction, thinking about uh, literature, really is based on uh, uh, the high period of uh, bourgeois realism, where you have uh, an account of Balzac, for, for instance, or Stendhal, that there is a production of totality which is accomplished. This is not dependent on the artist's intention, but the work of art produces a totality of the world from which it emerges. Now, this totality is possible, as you know, in, in um, uh, Lukács, because of a certain idea, you know, a certain kind of feature which he called the type. Now, the type is not really the stereotype in the way in which we use it ordinarily you know, in our discussions now. The type is actually a fusion of the particular and the universal. It, it, is, uh, it, it is not by sacrificing the particularity that it attains its universality. It is by permeating the particularity with the universal. The particularity becomes legible on account of its universality. So characters in uh, uh, realist novels, <clears throat> they are not you know, individuals who are absolutely trapped in their specificity but their specificity itself becomes intelligible in terms of the larger typifications which uh, they raise. Now, <clears throat> uh, Emil Zola, for example, failed this test of uh, Lukács. So naturalism for Lukács is actually uh, the, the being trapped in this domain of particulars which are not sufficiently integrated into the totality. And uh, a lot of uh, modernist writing Lukács felt actually inherited the tradition of naturalism. So like Joyce's Ulysses, for instance, you know, and uh, um, uh, in Kafka, you have uh, an inability to see the totality and an inability to locate the particular situations that you are representing as effects of that totality. So you may have actually uh, the world of isolation, the world of fear, the world of angst, but you are unable to create a fictional machinery where they appear connected with a larger totality which would allow us to make sense of them as effects of other kinds of relationships. And, and he felt that Thomas Mann uh, accomplished this. And uh, Thomas Mann himself seems to have been a bit uh, embarrassed by this compliment uh, uh, because uh, Thomas Mann's own kind of uh, uh, uses of technique, he often says, was playful, etc. Et so there is an ironic uh, valorization of irony in Thomas Mann's understanding of his own craft. Now, uh, Adorno is extremely critical of uh, this set of arguments of Lukács. In fact, it's a contrast with Lukács which initially clarifies to us Adorno's emphasis on uh, not extracting some kind of paraphrasable meaning from the work of art, or some kind of thematic. You know, when I say paraphrasable meaning, I'm actually, uh, you know, putting it probably too crudely. You know. uh, it's not like Lukács wanted a paraphrasable content, but there is a thematic, a thematic which, of course, you can connect with the worldview, and the worldview itself can be subjected to uh, criticism. Yeah. Now, you have uh, in Adorno a criticism of this procedure altogether. In opposition to that, what you actually find in Adorno is uh, something akin to the procedure he uh, developed in his uh, reading of music. That is where the social uh, meaning of the work of art is inscribed in the form itself. So, like in Kafka, for instance, you have an absolute subjectivity. That, that appears as a response to the reification of the world. This absolute subjectivity itself is the inscription 
the inscription of the social meaning of the work of art. So it is by encountering it and working with it, by submitting yourself to the law imposed on you by this work of art, that you actually make a, uh, 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 you actually arrive at a point of intelligibility. So this idea is, uh, it, so it, 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 it involves a kind of uh, engagement with, on your part with the reification of the world. Because the work of art, its absolute subjectivity, is a way of responding to that. That is what is highlighted there. Now, in his criticism of Brecht, Adorno seems to make the argument that uh, Brecht uh, uh, sometimes abolishes, uh, you know, in his critique of theatrical illusion, sometimes he presents a picture of the world as uh, available to you. That is, the truth of the world is available to you. So it can be didactically given to you. Uh, in the political address, you know, like this is uh, like a, a bourgeois marriage pretends to be such and such. It is exposed in the production. Then in that exposure, there is the impression given that the truth of this is available to you. Now, in Adorno's argument, that truth which is made easily available to you in Brecht is also an illusion. So there is no difficulty of relationship there that Adorno finds uh, a problem. Now, it is in Beckett where the crisis in meaning becomes the determinant of form and all that the work of art is that Adorno found uh, uh, a kind of response to this. Now, he has written something on end game, you know, and uh, uh, as I mentioned, aesthetic theory was meant to be dedicated to Beckett. Uh, so it's very interesting that it is in Beckett who was actually uh, at the opposite end of some kind of revolutionary art in any thematic sense that you find uh, Adorno finding a work of art which actually performs the difficult function of a work of art. That is, uh, the difficult function is actually to instantiate the difficulty of meaning. That is actually what uh, allows you to uh, uh, have some kind of critical relationship with reification, not in terms of a thematic, but in terms of an aesthetic. Aesthetic in the sense of, in terms of demanding a certain perceptual encounter with the fictional machinery itself. Yeah? So uh, this brings me to the last point. You know, uh, here again, I owe my, uh, what I have to say to uh, Gillian Rose's discussion of this in the beginning of her work. Uh, see, uh, Adorno has an important essay called Essay as Form. Yeah? Uh, it, I think it appears in Notes on Literature. You know, the two volume, one of the two volumes has it. So, uh, as I mentioned to you, um, Adorno was interested in the essay because it also allows a form of writing which is uh, the opposite of systematic writing. That is uh, something which uh, allows you to improvise with forms and thereby guard yourself against petrification into the comfort of what appears as systematic thinking. Now, these arguments we need to understand in relationship to Adorno's skepticism about clarity. You know, skepticism about uh, the self-assured clarity with which things are laid out and the stability of the concept, the unproblematic nature of the concept itself may actually be a form of distortion. You remember that earlier I, I mentioned uh, that mythical residue of language and the need to work with that. There again the argument was of a similar kind. So here um, Adorno often favors the renunciation of linearity and he speaks about his work as being presented in paratactic uh, fashion where they need to be apprehended as a cluster, you know, a constellation is the word he uses. And so it is the idea emerges in this apprehension of the parts by the reader. It is not a sequencing which is given to you which would get you there. Yeah? 
So the, this uh, uh, makes the reading of Adorno particularly difficult, and, uh, the teaching of Adorno particularly, Adorno's text particularly difficult, because they go against the uh, very methodology of uh, the pedagogic practices that we encourage in the university. Yeah? So uh, I think uh, the important uh, moment of uh, realization of this writing is probably to be found in Minima Moralia, you know, this uh, fragmentary essays he wrote, uh, which is the, the subtitle of the book was Reflections from a Damaged Life, or Reflections, of, uh, Reflections from a Damaged Life. Yeah? Reflections from Damaged Life. Yeah? So there you will find an attempt to uh, do philosophy or do the critical exercise of reason which does not uh, uh, rely on the scaffolding or the comforts of first principles and systematic thinking. Yeah. Now, uh, in spite of uh, the differences which we mentioned uh, in relationship to Benjamin, Benjamin was also a practitioner of uh, a, a non-systematic enunciation of philosophical thinking. Yeah. And, uh, in some of his writing, he was also a great practitioner of the essay. You know. uh, and Benjamin's on account of his uh, conceptual procedures uh, in the correspondence with Adorno takes the form of uh, invokes not a constellation but a monad. That's the, the image he uses. Uh, a philological procedure which is submitted to a historical construction the baselines of which are located in contemporary experience. This produces the monad, he says. In both these, you will see an attempt to move away from the, uh, what is considered as the systematic conceptual enunciation of uh, critical reasoning. So the, the, I, I thought I would mention this because uh, uh, this helps in appreciating the difficulty we encounter in Adorno as a certain mode which is intrinsic to the work that he is trying to do and uh, which he is trying the readers to get to do. Yeah. The, the, you know, we, we do not have time to really go into the question of uh, uh, Benjamin and uh, the debate which happened about the Arcades project. Uh, but um, Earlier, there was that uh, question of advertisement which came up, you know, so I would like to probably conclude with that. Now, how do we think about uh, uh, advertisements and uh, the work they do? And uh, in Adorno, as you, as you can clearly make out in the arguments on culture industry, you have a <clears throat> discussion of the manipulation of the domain of culture and the domain of cultural practices. So what is presented as uh, immediate, uh, what is presented as uh, something which speaks to you is already arranged in such a way uh, and your receptivity itself is organized in such a way. Now this, this is what uh, Adorno is trying to suggest. And, and you also know that uh, uh, in, uh, after the structuralist moment, uh, in the study of uh, popular culture or cultural representations, there has been a kind of attempt to uh, look at advertising. You know, and, uh, uh, and that was in terms of, uh, like in Roland Barthes, for example, you'll find it, in terms of understanding the work of advertising in terms of a semiology. You know, a, a semiology to the second degree, you could say, because there is connotation you know, which is created. And uh, it's also a kind of a count of ideology. Now, of course, uh, uh, Barth is extremely sensitive to the non-verbal dimensions of images. And uh, like the idea of uh, 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 abundance, for instance, or uh, happiness, or things like that, which are produced by a particular configuration of images. Huh? But it's important that these, uh, these model privileges a certain kind of signified with which they can be related. That is, uh, the, like for example, the Algerian soldier saluting the French flag 
at one level it's a sensory particularity of that image at, at another level in its sensory particularity it also produces an idea produces a signified yeah. now uh, the kind of things which we actually mentioned in relation to Benjamin would suggest to you that uh, um, the work of advertisement need to be probably understood in terms of the work it does with the human sensorium you know, like uh, the kind of point he made when he said uh, not what the neon light says neon sign says but the reflected pool of red on the asphalt you know, the the light itself as a sensory thing and how it works in relationship to your environment that becomes the point of uh, intersection. Is, is this called the subliminal uh, level of energy? Yeah, that, that, but you know, subliminal again, you know, uh, one problem is that we tend to think in terms of messages. You know? What message is the advertisement trying to give you? you know, this is the way. So that is basically the model of uh, uh, representation, meaning, etc., etc. Now, in Benjamin, there is a sense where it's not the message which matters, it's a certain way of working which creates uh, uh, the particular kind of subject for advertisement. And that is a subject of sensory experience, it's a subject of perceptual relationship, etc., etc. Now, uh, this is uh, closer to like people like uh, Tosig, for example, have uh, developed this kind of idea. And I feel that uh, this line of thinking is uh, closely anchored in what I have called uh, the question of the sensorium, the history of the human sensorium, and what is being transformed in that history in our times. Now, Adorno does not really uh, pose this question as such. The question of the sensorium sometimes I think is still understood in terms of, a, of an aspect of reason. The uh, uh, isolation or the theoretical isolation of the question of the sensorium may even appear as a, a moment of reification in relationship to the history of reason. This uh, uh, makes it difficult, this I think underlies the difficulty which uh, uh, comes to light uh, in the conversations between Adorno and Benjamin. You know. Now, in our times, there has been a revival of, uh, no, not a revival, but there has been a major uh, resurgence of interest in Benjamin. And our contemporary studies of culture sometimes accurately, sometimes inaccurately have gone back to Benjamin for ideas and resources. In Adorno, that such a return to Adorno hasn't happened in our times. It's interesting. And uh, one reason for that is probably uh, uh, this question of the entrapment of reason that uh, Adorno makes the central framework for his thinking. Their reason appears both as a positive and a negative category. It is not like there is something else outside reason which promises redemption. It's in that entrapment that the history of freedom in our times needs to be found. Yeah. That is a difficult challenge that Adorno's writings pose before us. Yeah. So I'll stop there, yeah? and then we can take uh, some questions. not so much a question as a kind yeah, of please, yeah. <laughs> point that I was thinking while you were in the last section of your talk. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a whole lot of things, but I won't go through all of it. One appears to me to uh, remember that for Benjamin, mm. the basic aesthetic type mm. is the image. Right. And for uh, Adorno, it's music. Right, right, right. And I think that right, that yeah, causes yeah. Yeah. a major, mm. as it were, um, difference in, in the way that they talk about, um, talk right. about aesthetic right, right. Uh, appearance and mm. even aura. Mm. 
uh, aura yeah. also appears differently yes, yes, yeah, in, in yeah. these two, two cases. Yeah. Um, uh, it, it, it appears to me that, that, I mean, this is not strictly relevant to what you were saying, mm. that in Benjamin also there's, there is a kind of suppressed anxiety about aura, which mm. appears in the storyteller essay. Right, yes. Yes, where, experience. Yeah. Yes, and, and experience and that, you know, immediacy and, yeah. as it were, uniqueness of experience, which he also values, as yes. it were. Uh, somewhat paradoxically, yes. if one thinks of yeah, that. Yeah. So I think yeah. that uh, Benjamin is not really able to move uh, because Adorno, I think, at least situates himself courageously in a certain mm. position, Correct. which he, in Benjamin, the position is more tenuous and more yes. constantly being negotiated because the little history of photography yes. is different from the Essay in the Work arcades fine. is different from yeah. both of these. And yeah. Yeah. The last thing I'd just like to say, these are comments, is, and mm. no, I'm not expecting any just the other questions must be there, is, is uh, one thing which, which is, 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 is somewhat outrageous, but still, mm. you see, it, it appears to me that this entire, um, that the, the rhetoric, mm. which has always troubled me mm. in Horkheimer and Ador, uh, Adorno's mm. 40, 49 essay. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Um, is an experience of living in America mm. and being beset by the American culture machine. Mm. And it is different mm. for Benjamin because mm. Benjamin yes. ultimately is unable to go there mm. and Benjamin mm. is living in the attenuated mm. cultural world, in the world mm. of where, where the negotiation or the um, circulation of culture is mm. far more attenuated <coughs> because of the lack of, of, the, of, of the pressure of monopoly capital mm. in wartime Europe. Mm. And on the other hand, it's, it's America, yes. where the film industry. I mean, you mm. think of the examples that mm. Adorno considered as largely yes. examples from the film industry. Yes. Yeah, all yeah. yeah thank you. Thank you, Amlan. You know, all these three are very, very, uh, very important and insightful points. And about the image and music, it's so evident. You know, and uh, uh, at the same time, I do not fully know how to think it. You know, like, uh, what would its uh, uh, implications be for uh, thinking this question of the aesthetic? You know, and uh, how would it be different? Um, and uh, you are right about the question of aura. And the work of art essay is dealing with a certain political question. You know, that's. Uh, which comes up you know, so strongly in the last paragraphs of the essay. But uh, there again, there is an ambiguity of the non erratic which is spoken about, because you can have technological reproducibility used for reinscribing and reproducing the aura. So you can have a mass subject of fascism, which may actually begin to look closer to Adorno's understanding of the mass subject. And you may have a mass subject which may have a distinctive uh, idea of uh, agency. Yeah. Now, what interest, interests me in the work of art essay in relation to the masses is that there is an attempt to think of a certain subjectivity, the subject of culture as the masses, which is not really one of manipulation, which is not really located in the individual as such. You know. Those things are fascinating. You know. and that, that happens in relationship, as uh, I mentioned, to ideas of distraction. Now, Aura, uh, Benjamin is also a great writer of aura, great auratic writer, you know, about uh, technology, the collector, you know, the great uh, essay on the collector. Uh, one way street. One way street, one way street. the entire one way street is that, you know. And uh, so it's not like a, uh, an argument uh, which wants you to uh, hate auratic experience, you know. It is. Uh, an argument about the decay of aura, which uh, this, you could say that the storyteller is again about the disappearance of experience, you know, the unavailability of experience. And what at our times or in our times is actually the consequence of it for thinking about art? This is really the, the question uh, which comes up. And uh, the last point you made, I've. That was a quote, America. Yeah, America, you're right. America. You know, like, yeah. Yeah, like uh, uh, 
Strozek or something like that. You know, there's a bit of that kind of. Uh, the entire Jewish community yes. who were able to do that move there. Yeah. I think it's, it's there for it to be as open as critique as about Yeah. I yeah. can't think of thinking about it. Like yeah, about yeah, it. yeah. Of, of, of index for this time, mm. I don't see that this, uh, you know, this, this essay is so much mm. about the American film. Mm. Yeah, Hollywood is actually a model for the culture industry. Yes, absolutely. So, I was thinking yeah. about the yeah. examples. He doesn't yeah. talk about yeah. the examples in GM, war. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely. The, absolutely, yeah. As on the other hand, those, those attenuated mm. artifacts like Mozart, mm. which are there, mm. as it were. Yeah. Mozart is up here for grabs. Yeah. Is jazz, jazz, yeah, jazz. critique of jazz. This, yeah. And this kind of horrified sensibility of somebody who can really yeah. bar from musician. Yeah, and, yeah. Yeah. I mean, these are just yeah, and and the reconsidered essay, which is written later, yes, again, uh, again, actually, you know, it it actually tries <laughs> to develop that uh, other notion of culture, you know, yeah. and uh, and then you have essays like uh, lyric poetry and society, you know, which again tries to show the social meaning of the form of lyric poetry, you know, and uh, which which is which is also radical in that sense, you know. So, but you're you're right, you know, the the presence of. Uh, Europe and America, they are the important. Uh, yes. No. Yeah. The, the music was quite a core part of his being. Yes. I mean, I probably didn't grasp it in the lecture so much, but did he actually perform yeah, actually, the things he composed? Mm. They were played. What was the reaction? Yeah, Amla, and you would be able to say more about this. I mean, he composed. And, uh, he, was, uh, he, he learned music from childhood. Yeah. He studied with Albert. He, he was a very proficient performer on the piano. He uh, studied with what's Albenberg. Uh, Albenberg. And he was a great admirer of Schoenberg. Yes. So he was a modernist in, in, yeah. in that sense, yeah. in terms of, of the chromatic. It, yeah, it music, yeah. So, so um, and, and, and he, he had as some of the really beautiful images here, which. Part so, okay. uh, shows his, his annotations on a musical score. So he was, he was a he was a committed, as it were, um, music uh, lover and uh, connoisseur. Um, he I, I don't know whether he performed professionally. Yeah, I, I, I doubt, doubt it. But he yeah. was certainly a very gifted and, and he wrote, wrote extensively. He wrote extensively yeah. so much about yeah. music and yeah. so central to his yeah. ways of thinking about cultures. Yeah. It's, because I think that, that, that most of us have one way which mm. is comes more comfortably mm. in my case you know, you know I think that, that in, I think about Benjamin it, it's more that he thinks about image. the image which, which is constantly going around in his head but in the case of Adorno I think it's so often that he sort of takes up the, the, the example of music yeah yeah, well, what would be interesting is also to probably look at what both these people wrote about literature. Probably yes, yes. there, you know, like in the case of uh, maybe their readings of Kafka. Yes. You know, and maybe we'll we'll get a sense of. Uh, Perhaps that's why mm, the thing mm, about Beckett. Mm, yeah, yeah. It's all it's like music. Yeah, that's right. Yeah.